Council, you order of the uh, third meeting of the Common Council. Clerk, call the roll. Do you want me to do the you? poll first? Sure, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Every citizen of this country should be guaranteed that their vote matters, that their vote is counted, and that in the voting booth, their vote has as much weight as that of any CO, any member of Congress, or any president. Thank you. Now the clerk will call the roll. Okay, press one if you're here, please. <laughs> I just press two one day. But... John? There you go. Bill? Aiming at it, Bill. There you go. There you go. Okay. Enter. 14 present. There is a quorum present. Pledge of Allegiance, we'll have Alderman Carlson lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Looking for a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there any discussion? Any changes? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Go ahead and press one for yes, two for no. Fourteen eyes. Motion carried. We now have the swearing in of all the person elect. William Wangaman. Bill, if you wouldn't mind coming up here, please. Okay, would you raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, William Wangaman. I, William Wangaman. Swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And will faithfully and impartially. Will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the office of older person. Of the office of older person. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. We all welcome you, Alderman Wangaman. We all welcome you here and welcome you back. It's good to see you. Resignation from William Gutzucker from the Board of Police and Fire Commissioners. We need a motion to accept and file. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to accept and file. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept and file. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by, oh, I'm sorry. Clerk will call the roll. One for yes, two for no, please. Fourteen eyes. Motion carries. First, we'll have a presentation from the tourism, an update on tourism. Good evening. I'm Amy Wilson, the uh, tourism director at the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. And this is the first time I've done with, with the screen over my head, so most of you who know me, I can't use my hands tonight. <laughs> um, if you take out your packets, that's what we'll be looking at. I'm not sure on the screen if you'll be able to see all the numbers without the packets. So what we're going to review first is an update on the new economic model that the State Department of Tourism is using to calculate economic impact. And then we'll look at where the county is positioned and then where the city is positioned in relation to that. Um, so I'm on this the very first slide here, which is the new model and the switch. For 20 years, the Wisconsin State Department of Tourism um, was using Davidson Peterson and Associates, and after that time, they switched to Tourism Economics, which is a Longwoods International company. The um, Tourism Economics employs a cutting-edge input-output in-plan model that profiles an economy by measuring the relationships 
among industries and consumers and calculating three levels of impact being direct, indirect, and induced. And that's different than what we had in the past. The major differences that you'll notice in the new model, um, the, the major, absolute major difference, is that tourism economics uses a conservative model that assumes 40% of sales within recreation industries are generated by visitor activity compared to 98% in the old Davidson Peterson analysis. What that means is the old model implied that spending on activities such as movie theaters, bowling alleys, golf courses, and sporting events were generated mostly by visitors with much less local demand. And everyone here knows local residents use bowling alleys, movie theaters, and go to sporting events in their own communities. So 20 years ago when Davidson Peterson used that model, it was really the only one available at the time. There's more sophisticated models now. Okay. Um, and basically that model works in communities such as Las Vegas where tourism spending is much higher than local spending, but in a destination such as Wisconsin, it's outdated. So the data sources used for this model are actually more diverse than they've been before as well. Tourism economics employs data from the Bureau of Economics Analysis, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, lodging performance data from Smith Travel Research, tax receipt data from the Wisconsin State Department of Revenue, and U.S. Census data on seasonal second homes for recreational use. So you can see this is a much more dynamic model than we've had in the past. And just a reminder on why we even quantify tourism economy, I mean, who cares? People come here anyway, right? <laughs> well, by monitoring tourism's e economic impact, policymakers such as yourselves can make informed decisions regarding the funding and prioritiz prioritization of tourism development, can also carefully monitor its successes and future needs, and in order to do this, tourism must be measured in the same categories as other economic sectors, utilizing variables for tax generation, employment, wages, and gross domestic product, which is typically how manufacturing and agricultural industries are measured. So tourism economics has now stepped up in that same realm. Now, if we look at the first chart, we see that, and I, this is very small, so hopefully you can see it on the paper, if not the screen. According to the new model, in 2010, Sheboygan County ranked 15th in visitor spending among all 72 counties. And in 2011, that ranking jumped to number 14. Now, I should let you know that while this is the first year that we're using the new model, when they brought it in, they, they went and re, went back to recalculate 10 and 11 so that we would have a comparison to start with because the old model was simply apples and oranges and we would have nothing to look at to see where we started as a baseline. So we've already moved up a point in one year. And I'm on the next page now. According to the new model in 2011, Sheboygan County ranked 14th in the state in terms of number of jobs supported by tourism. Go to the next slide, we see that in 2011, Sheboygan County increased the amount of state and local, local tax dollars generated by tourism to about a little over 3.5% or about 800,000 extra dollars that went to local and state government. And the next slide, among the Lakeshore counties, Sheboygan County ranked fifth in terms of visitor spending in 2010 and 11. Between those two years, visitor spending in the county increased by about 6.2% or $10.5 million. And this is really our sweet spot because this is our market area. And I'm sure I've said before, and I'll tell everyone again if you haven't heard, the I-43 corridor is the longest running throughway that captures the most tourism dollars in, in the state, and we're right in the center of that. So we're in a very good position here. And we're on the next slide there. In 2010 and 11, Sheboygan County ranked fourth among the Lakeshore counties in terms of number of jobs supported by tourism. And with a $10.5 million increase in visitor spending, the county experienced a 1.6% decrease in jobs supported by tourism from the prior year that resulted in a 4.61 decrease in aggregated labor income, or about $3.2 million. Now remember, this is a county-wide number, so it's not necessarily applies just to the city of Sheboygan. And the next slide, the nine counties along the Lake Michigan shores of Wisconsin capture 31% of total state visitor spending, 
while contributing 32% of total state jobs supported by tourism that realize almost 40% of total state labor income generated by tourism. So tourism's lakeshore economic impact is a significant force to the economic robustness of these communities and the county, and the state, actually. And we're on the next slide now. And now we're gonna kind of shift down and see how this calculates into the state and to city room tax dollars. In 2011, in Wisconsin, overnight stays along with higher prices pushed accommodation spending up 7.8%. So that means there were more overnight stays and the hotel room rates were slightly up. In 2011 in Wisconsin, room demand growth grew 3.6% regardless of how many room nights there were or what the price for the rooms were. So now if we translate that down to say, well, how are we doing then? We have our, our how we measure our city success is through the room tax collected. So the city of Sheboygan has an 8% room tax that's added on to the room rate every time someone checks into a lodging facility. And out of that 8%, as you know, 30% of that is remains in the city budget and 70 goes to support tourism promotion and development per the Wisconsin state room tax statute. So if we look at 2010 and 11 by quarter, between those two years in quarter one, and these are hard city numbers, not county numbers, and they exclude Blue Harbor because that, that room tax for Blue Harbor, of course, is paying off the conference center. So between 2010 and 11, tourism um, increased 14% of room tax that it captured for promotion in quarter two, the increase was 10% in room tax collection. Quarter three realized a 22% increase, and quarter four realized a 37% increase, with an overall increase for the year of 20% in tourism. So as you can see by our measurement, relating back to the state numbers on the overnight stays and the room rates and, and demand growth, which averages about 6%, we're really in a good position since we've already increased 20% in a year. On the next slide, um, this is the room tax history for the city of Sheboygan that's come to the tourism department for promotion and development. And it goes back to 2005 and through a projection of 2012. But if we look at 2005 through 2011, in 2011 you'll see the green numbers for quarter three and quarter four. They're green because those were the years in that time period that captured the highest amounts of room tax in the history that we have. The blue number for quarter two in 2011 is the second highest amount for quarter two that's been captured in the history that we have. And of course, for 2011, total room tax was the highest amount it's going back to 2005. If we look at what we're projecting now that we see the trends and it's National Tourism Week starting yesterday and the state numbers were released, we go back and look at the trends for 2012, you'll see that we're projecting quarters two, three, and four to also be the highest quarters for room tax that we will realize going back to 2005. Um, but as we look at these variables throughout the year, we also have to pay attention to things that tourism travel is sensitive to in the market. So if we go to the next slide, the economic impact variables that we'll be watching, of course, is that there was some slowdown <clears throat> inevitable for inventory-driven rebound in 2010 coming off the 2009 recession. There's still some effect there. Um, obviously, right now, debt worries are driving government policy. We all hear about that. High oil and commodity prices are a national trend that keeps affecting consumer sentiment. Household and corporate caution, now compounded by financial market volatility, mostly coming out of Europe, but still impacts household savings and consumer discretionary spending. And nationally, travel during quarter one has been trending down since 2008. That's not so surprising, since that's January through March, and it's very volatile that time of year. If you can spend a dollar and you're not sure about the weather, you're probably gonna wait especially with, with the caution of consumers right now. Travel during quarter four is also extremely weather dependent. Holiday travel keeps it up, but it's very weather dependent. And along with this study and telling us the economic positioning, um, Tourism Economics Report also to told us the top things um, that travelers experienced on overnight trips to Wisconsin. And if you look at this list, we're still in a very, very strong position. The number one, 
thing they experienced was lakes and rivers. Well, welcome to Sheboygan. <laughs> and pretty much everything else on here, including the small towns and villages, friends, relatives, rural farming areas, experiencing the forest, historic areas, and wildlife I usually don't see. <laughs> All of those are things that we offer in the community, so we're still in a strong market position. So overall, Sheboygan's market position going into peak season 2012 remains very strong. Any questions? Alderman Born. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Amy, do you have access to the uh, room tax numbers for Blue Harbor, how they've been tracking since it opened in, what was it, 2006 or five? Actually, no, those are tracked by the city. I believe your finance department has access to them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next presentation will be by the Senior Activity Center. Hi, my name is Wendy Schmitz. I'm a senior, and I do it the old-fashioned way, pencil on a legal pad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the supervisor of the Senior Activity Center. Once a year, I give an update on what is happening at the center. It's fitting that I'm presenting at the beginning of May, as May is Celebrate Older Americans Month. We have a lot to celebrate in Sheboygan. Despite a very tough year in the state and city, we had a great year. The staff and participants rose to the occasion and worked together to make us better than ever. With almost 24,000 visits in 2011, something is happening because 94 new people have joined the Senior Center since the beginning of this year. So far, we have seen an increase of 389 visits per month. I also like to remind you that we're only open Monday through Thursday. <laughs> Who or what is responsible for the growth? It could be my staff who have worked for the city for 17 and 29 years and still describe their jobs as fun. Really, they do. They set the tone of energy and enthusiasm that is infectious to others. Our senior participants are changing. They come to the center wanting to stay active and engaged in their community. Our seniors are the people who work at the hospitals, the Stephanie Weil Theater, John Michael Kohler Art Center, Salvation Army, St. Vincent de Paul, make braille Bibles, our foster grandparents, the list goes on. When not volunteering in the community, they come to play at the center. However, Sheboygan has a history of a strong work ethic. 29 of our programs were developed and are led by our senior volunteers. In the last few months, new participants have approached me and asked if they could start Canasta, a book club, a music jam session, a greeting card club, orchid growing presentations, and most recently, a conversational Spanish class. Starting tomorrow, we're offering Reiki and reflexology too. Last year, our volunteers, with the help of students from Tower Academy, worked to create landscaping with a grant from the Home Depot. The commission worked on improving our energy efficiency as we replace ballasts and bulbs and qualify for focus on energy incentives. This year, we received a $2,000 grant from Alliant Energy to develop a new program, collecting stories and sharing memories with the community. Our seniors are a talented, valuable resource to this community. Our tax preparers gave up three months of their time to go through annual training and work two days a week to offer a free service to the community. This year, the program served 793 people. 
We participated in the Pat Graney Chair Spectacle and House of Mind performance at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center. We taught children and families how to make stepping stones at Above and Beyond Children's Museum. We continued to walk children to school on Wednesdays, and now we are helping to train Navi, the search and rescue dog. I use the royal we. I don't do these things. <laughs> They do these things. The Friends of the Senior Activity Center hires our volunteer manager, which makes all of this possible. Last week, she and a team of our volunteers worked at the Wisconsin Volunteer Coordinators Statewide Conference held for the first time at Blue Harbor. The Senior Activity Center was responsible for all of the hospitality. 300 conference participants received bags promoting local businesses. The Friends are also responsible for all of our fundraising. We are able to offer a wide variety of programs to a diverse group of people because of our fundraising efforts. As well as all the usual brat fries, bake sales, and small fundraisers last year, we were given the opportunity to do something unique. In November, we set up a factory at the Senior Center, and 22 people volunteered to work to raise money towards our renovation project. That turned out to be so successful that in February and March, 20 seniors went to RCS every Friday to help with a rollout project. The money that they earned as volunteers was donated back to the center. When added to a, a I'm sorry, when added to a memorial fund from one of these volunteers, the total raised was $5,754. The Volrath company also de donated all of the kitchen supplies. The theme of Older Americans Month is never too old to play. Our hardworking participants are just as passionate about their play. Last year, our TV show, which focused on our fitness programs, earned a silver award. Five of our table tennis players earned medals at the Badger State Games. We can still boast that we have a state champion and two of our members represented Sheboygan at the Nationals in Texas. We have challenged the mayor. He came to see his um, competition and as yet has not played. <laughs> we will be going on our third annual skydiving trip in July, and our artists are busy creating canvases for the Small Works auction with Sheboygan's visual artists. Last year, 12 of our artists and photographers went to England for the St. Ives Arts and Music Festival. We rented a house right in the town, and they were able to walk to the classes and events. This year, we have 23 people so far going on a cultural exchange to Cuba. For all those people who still think that they are not old enough to come to the Senior Center, don't wait too long. Your seniors do Sheboygan proud, and they are having the time of their lives. And I would now like to introduce Scott Johnston, who is one of our Friends board members. And when he joined the board a year ago, he learned that the organization was responding to a community survey to improve the image of the center and to accommodate our ever-increasing number of active seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I appreciate the introduction. Yes, my name is Scott Johnston. I'm a retired executive from Thomas Industries. And about two years ago, after being retired about two years, my wife kicked me out of the house and said, do something. So I decided <laughs> to get into the volunteering world, and I headed up the initiative to begin the Volunteer Center of Sheboygan County under the direction of the United Way. And it's been a lot of fun. Also, about a year ago, uh, Wendy approached me and said, 
we'd like you to become a, a, a board member of the Senior Activity Center. And I kind of declined, but she's very tenacious, and I finally joined. And I'm glad I did. I thought I'd go there, and it would make me feel older, but I, every time I go there, I feel much younger. That's a lot of adrenaline pumping in that uh, building. So I've really appreciated that. Um, approximately six months ago, we pulled the trigger on starting to raise funds for a, re a renovation at the uh, Senior Center. It needs it. The, as Wendy said, the growth rate at the Senior Center is growing by leaps and bounds. It's double digit, and I would say with the renovation and an aggressive marketing campaign that will begin this year, the membership is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. So uh, we need to make the renovation happen. Um, we're neophytes at raising funds, the first time we've ever had to do it. Um, it wasn't a great success, but it was a good start. And our key initiative this year is to really renovate and rejuvenate our fundraising campaign that's sustainable long term and it will be a yearly type event. We've decided to pull the trigger on making the first phase of the renovation happen. We've raised $38,000 year to date. Yeah, most of which comes from the membership of the um, Senior Center. Uh, the, the gap that exists for the phase one that Joe Clark will present, uh, the, the Friends has decided to fill the gap and um, backfill as, as time goes on. So we need to make it happen. Um, I'd also like to say that we've yet to really make the community fully aware of the Senior Activity Center. And that's another key initiative of ours. Even though the membership exceeds 600 members right now, I think it's going to continue to grow, all the more reason for us to proceed with the renovation project. So I'm, I'm having a blast at the Senior Center. I feel young every time I leave the building. And I'd now like to turn it over to Joe Clark, who's a member of the Growth Design Group out of Cedarburg, Wisconsin, who will describe exactly what we're trying to do. Thanks. Joe. my easel doesn't fall over here. Uh, Joe Clark from Growth Design Group. It's a privilege to be here tonight and uh, a lot of fun working with the uh, friends of the, the Senior Activity Center, trying to realize the very clear vision that they had for the new dynamic life they wanted to breathe into their, their old and very solid building. Uh, the first part that we're focusing on, while we do have some additional phases, the first phase is concentrating on uh, reworking the two kitchen rooms that they have currently and the lobby space right at the crossing of their two main courtyards. And we'll be turning that into a more active cafe environment uh, with a little coffee shop sort of feel, uh, open seating and great sight lines so that everyone can see what's going on and those wonderful smells can, can spread through the space. So this is what the new lobby space, the hub at the center of those crossroads would look like. Uh, a lot more open and visible uh, and hopefully encouraging the, the activity that's actually happening down there so that everyone can see it. The cafe space is still small given uh, the requirements of, of what they've got to work with, uh, but we're trying to make it lively and, and bright and uh, a fun space to be in. And another view looking out at the sight lines that connect you to the rest of the, uh, the center and signage that helps to give people a better feel for where they need to go when they check in and how to get to the other parts of the center. The other pieces of the puzzle that uh, if fundraising continues, we'll get to eventually are looking back to the hospitality room which will open up to be a much more multi-use type space uh, with a lot of flexibility. Uh, we have several different layouts possible for this area. And the other piece eventually that will be developed is the art room, 
which just needs to be modernized uh, and made uh, more practical for the users of the space. Uh, it's being opened up so it's a much larger space um, and a lot of built-in storage to get the clutter out of the way so it's a, a much nicer work environment. And another view of that art room. So the focus of the first phase is just that cafe area and the central hub. Uh, but there are visions for the future. And I was asked to keep this as short as possible. Uh, so with that, if there are questions for any of the Senior Activity Center people. Any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> City Clerk, is there anybody for the public forum? Uh, yes. We have one person this evening, Greg Lee. If you wouldn't mind coming on up to the microphone. <clears throat> and Greg, can I have your home address, please? Um, W1981 Mayberry Road. And that's where? In the town of Sheboygan. Town, OK. And you will have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Um, first <coughs> off, Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, more importantly, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Greg Lee. I'm the owner and operator of Euros To Go. It's a new um, Greek food truck that I just recently opened three weeks ago. Um, I've, I've born and raised in Sheboygan, but I spent the last 10 years in Los Angeles. And um, while I was there, I noticed the boom of food trucks. Um, and I really liked the business model. And I had this idea that I wanted to open one up in Sheboygan. Um, and uh, because I love Sheboygan and my family's here. Um, and uh, so I just recently moved back and started that. Um, so having only been open three weeks, um, just an overwhelmingly positive response um, from everyone. So um, when I, when I <coughs> read about the ordinance, um, there was, there's definitely some issues in there that um, I, I have I just questions about. Um, uh, mainly, I guess I would like to start with uh, the, the fee increase um, is to, from $100 to $500. Um, I would just kind of like, I guess, really like to know um, why such a drastic increase. Um, I did a little bit of research and um, like, for instance, New York City, um, their food truck permit is $200. Um, Philadelphia, $150. Um, and in, in Sheboygan, I, you know, definitely the potential for um, my financial gain is obviously not that of, of such a larger city. Um, and for me, my business is all about my location and time and the, the, the patrons and voting members of the city dictate um, what, uh, what they want. Um, so I guess my other issue is um, the, the time constraints um, about my hours of operation. Um, I, when opening this truck, I wanted to be able to provide food for people that are out on Michigan Avenue to create a location um, for people that are leaving the bar to get something into their stomach um, if, if, if they're drinking or, or what have you. Um, and I think that 2.30 um, really would, would affect m my business and, um, and, and the other food trucks. Um, so I, I guess I, I looked into Milwaukee and during the week, they they can stay open until 3, and the weekends they can stay open until 3.30. Um, and it, with all this, I, I really would like to know if, if there's documented complaints that would, that would um, cause these issues, um, that, that would cause this ordinance to come about, and, and what they were for, if it's about selling the same um, items as a brick and mortar location, um, and this has to do with parking within a certain distance. Um, I, why is it different that I'm a truck? Um, if I wanted to open up a pizza shop next to a pizza shop, I, if it's a free enterprise and I could do that. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm offering a service for the patrons of local bars, for their customers to, to enjoy alcohol and have food in their systems so that they aren't drinking on an empty stomach and not getting as intoxicated. Also promoting um, patrons of the bars to hang out longer and um, spend more money and buy more drinks, um, helping the bars make more money. 
And on another note, when, since we were speaking about tourism, um, just in these three weeks that I've been open, an overwhelming amount of my patrons have been tourists because they recognize, oh, it's a food truck. Like they, they identify with it, so they're spending more money in Sheboygan um, um, seeing the truck. Um, and it, w again, with the with the 2:30 in the morning, um, if if I didn't if people didn't want food at that time, I wouldn't try to be open. But that's generally when pe people would like to eat, um, rather than forcing them to drive across town, what have you, um, to, to other um, brick and mortar locations that are open at that time. I just, I'm, I'm just really puzzled as to why my hours of operation would, um, would have a restraint on them. Um, and putting, you know, these kind of restrictions on, um, uh, on a possible growing sector of the food industry, um, at, in its infancy, you know, I can see really being harmful. I, I would like to see Sheboygan have more food trucks like a lot of the other big cities. I would like to create um, these locations of sorts that where a lot of food trucks line up together and people will come from other cities and they'll spend more money in town. Um, and, um, and that brings more money to the city through sales tax. So, in another note, um, me being Greek, a, a Greek man 80 years ago started a food cart and later his family went on to open Jooms, which, you know, is a staple in Sheboygan. Excuse um, me, Greg, would you like an additional minute? Uh, no, I, I think I'm, I think that's pretty much you it. You sure? Okay. Yeah. Um, but thank you all for hearing me out. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Thank you very much. That would be it for public forum. All right. And we have a hearing. <clears throat> to amend the zoning map to change the use district classification of 1305 St. Clair Avenue. Is anybody here to speak on the hearing? Anybody here to speak? Anyone here to speak on the hearing? Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, move to close the hearing. Sorry. It's been moved and seconded to close the oh. hearing. Oh. The clerk will call the roll. You would vote one yes, two no, please. Bill? There you go. 14 ayes. Motion carried. Consent agenda 3 1 through 3 11 will be referred. 4 1 and 4 2, both communications. I'm sorry. Alderman Hammond. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, move to accept and file all ROs, accept and adopt all RCs, and all resolutions and ordinance be put upon their passage. It's been moved and seconded to Second. pass all ROs, pass all RCs, and all resolutions to substitute resolutions be put upon their passage. Is there any discussion? The clerk will call the roll. One for yes, two for no, please. Fourteen ayes. Motion carried. 4-1 and 4-2 both re will be referred. Report of officers 5-1, report of officer submitting communication from Chief Domogowski stating the police department does not oppose the request of the Sheboygan JCs to extend their hours of serving beverages in the 2012 Bratwurst Day celebration. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, move to accept and file and approve the request. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept and file and approve the request. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? The clerk will call the roll. One yes, two no, three abstain. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 5-2 through 5-15 will be referred. 6-1, a resolution lifting the hiring freeze in order to temporarily hire Schedule X employees in the Building Inspection Department. Alderman Raisler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the resolution be put upon its passage. Is there any discussion? Clerk will call the roll. One yes, two no. Bill, thank you. 14 ayes. 
Motion carried. 6-2, a resolution lifting the hiring freeze in order to hire a community service officer in the police department. Alderman Ressler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the resolution be put upon its passage. Is there any discussion? Clerk will call the roll. Jody. Not paying attention. Thanks. 14 eyes. Motion carried. Resolution confirming the ex exercising of police powers for making an assessment for the benefit of property against which an assessment is proposed for water lateral replacement at 1322 North 13th Street. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the resolution be put upon its passage. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. One yes, two no, three abstain. <coughs> Corey. Here, one in every crowd. <laughs> Thank you. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 6-4 through 6-8 will be referred. 7-1, the report of the committee by law and licensing recommending denying taxi cab license 9503. Alderman Van Thank you, Your Honor. Is uh, Simon Rodriguez here tonight? He is not here. Um, I move that the RC be accepted and adapted. It's been Second. moved and seconded that the RC be accepted and adopted. Under discussion. Um, Simon Rod Rodriguez was re asked to come to our meeting two different occasions and he did not come to either, so we had to deny his license. Is there any other discussion? Clerk will call the roll. One yes, two no, three abstain. Fourteen ayes. Motion carried. Report of the Committee from Public Protection and Safety recommended filing communication from the Sheboygan Yacht Club requesting the city organize authority for fireworks on the Harbor Fest 2012. Alderman Van Ackeren. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the committee report be accepted and adopted. Is there any discussion? Clerk will call the roll. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm on the right one. Seven two. Seven two. Corey. Bill. Thank you. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 7-3, report from law and licensing recommending denying beverage operator li license 9502. Alderman Van Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the RC be accepted and adopted. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the RC be accepted and adopted. Under discussion, Alderman Van Is Leah Mason here tonight? She is not here. Uh, she appeared before our committee with a long list of violations since 2008, and the committee voted five to zero to deny her license. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. <clears throat> One yes, two no. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 7-4, report from Committee of Law and Licensing recommending denying taxi driver <coughs> license 9522. Alderman Vanderwilly. I move that the RC be accepted and adopted. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the RC be accepted and adopted. Under discussion, Alderman Vanderwilly. For this gentleman, Tyler Metzner, he um, called us and said that he no longer wanted to pursue his license, so we denied it. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. One eyes, two no's. Anybody in? 14 eyes. Motion carried. 7 5, report of committee from Law and Licensing recommending amending Chapter 78 of the Sheboygan Municipal Code to create Article 3 relating to mobile food vendors. Alderman Vanderwilly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the RC be accepted and adopted and pass the ordinance. 
Second. Mo moved and seconded that the RC be adopted and the ordinance be passed. Under discussion, Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I actually was a little surprised to see this one. Um, I guess I wasn't aware there was an issue with, with food trucks. Um, I happen to think it's kind of neat to have them around, but that be as it may, to go from $100 to $500 seems rather extreme. Um, and I guess I'd just like to know what the impetus was. Was there, are we getting complaints? Is there a public safety issue? You know, what the concern is that prompt the, um, you know, extreme measures that at least I think that this is taking. So um, I would be interested to hear what the impetus for this was. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. Well, I would wait until somebody wants to answer Alderman Hammond's questions if somebody wants to answer them and then I've got a follow up. Thank you. Alderman Van Der Wille. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we really didn't have any complaints. Um, actually, what it was was um, there are certain things right now that technically are legal at this point with the food trucks. So we needed to clean that up. And at that time, we decided to do the entire ordinance since we had heard that there's also um, more food trucks that would like to start a business in Sheboygan. Alderman Hammond, you want to follow up on your question? Absolutely. See the look in your eye. Uh, and I'm all for, you know, if there's things cleaning up the ordinance, but if there's other, it just seems to me like we just look, looked at this and said, well, it's $100, we know other people are coming in, so we're going to take it to $500. And that just, you know, doesn't seem, or at least to me, seem right. Um, and then the 2.30 a.m. thing, again, um, you know, I, I don't know if we looked at other municipalities and what they were doing or talked to the people that are, are operating these, these vehicles to find out, you know, what uh, their prime times are and things like that, but it would seem to me like, uh, um, Maybe we need to think through at least those two parts and uh, uh, a little bit further before we approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hanna. Alderman Bourne now. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would agree with uh, President Hammond. Uh, being a former small businessman myself in this community for 33 and a half years and always being an advocate for small business issues, I have a problem when local, state, or federal governments want to impose what I feel and some of these are quite a burden to this gentleman who's just out there trying to make a buck and make a living for himself. I would definitely agree with Alderman Hammond that we should take another look at modifying that fee. And I see Alder, uh, Police Chief Namagalski is in the audience tonight. I don't want to put him on the spot, but I would suggest maybe a six month trial to allow the gentleman to stay open maybe a half hour to 45 minutes after bar closing on a trial basis, and it just would get uh, Chief Namagalski's initial reaction to that. Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Can you wait one second, Chief? We've got two other people that are going to come in here first. Alderman Riesler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess one of the things that, um, that, that I look at it is uh, from my experience in, in law enforcement, and, and the Chief can look at this, is some of the congregating that may happen uh, because of this. Uh, and in response to that, I'm working on, it with, on an ordinance uh, with the police department and uh, attorney Adams um, for a loitering ordinance that would probably alleviate some of the, the problems of people congregating if they weren't doing business with this, with this gentleman or another food truck, thus putting the onus back on the individuals who are causing the problems, not necessarily the small business person <coughs> who's just trying to make a living. So I mean, we're working on that. So. I guess what I would ask if, if worse comes to worse is we kind of hold this until we can get that ordinance in place and maybe that would make um, some of the other people that um, are concerned about the congregating um, a little bit more at ease and maybe loosen up the hours a little bit and, and, and not have the, the, the hour um, prerequisite. So, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Wiesler. You want to come first or should we have the chief? Chief, if you have a... The issue as I see it is that if you look at crime in the city between the hours of 1.30 and 4 o'clock in the morning, all of that crime is centered around the taverns in this city. That crime considers uh, disturbances, assaults, thefts, and criminal damage. The police department has worked very hard over the last two years to partner with the taverns 
create a tavern safety coalition to try to address those issues. The biggest factor in those issues is what Alderman Raisler uh, mentioned, and that's the tavern closes and everybody wants to go and hang out outside the tavern. So we've tried to actively engage the tavern owners into taking responsibility for that and getting people to move along. I think one of the things that we have to understand is people, when they're under the influence of alcohol, don't think rationally, are more aggressive than they tend to be normally, and aren't um, afraid of sanctions and all those other issues. So one thing that I would not like to encourage is people leaving taverns, hanging out in those neighborhoods where those taverns are. And I think it's very important that we do not forget the other stakeholders in that, those being the residents that live in those neighborhoods that don't want people hanging out in their neighborhood at 2.30 in the morning, making noise, getting into fights, damaging their property, littering their property, and all the other things that come along with it. So in my opinion, at this point, it's a good business practice to limit that. And people that are at those taverns that want something to eat are free to leave the tavern at 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning, and get what they want and go on their way. Thank you. Any questions of the chief? Alderman Lassar. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have questions of the chief. What I do have a main concern with is the parking of these food trucks in front of restaurants during the operating hour. Um, our operating restaurants pay taxes. And if they break this fee down to 12 months, it's $41 a month. And we have taxpayers that count on their business. We don't want the food trucks blocking their business. I know that there's something in the ordinance about 100 feet, but I'm, I'm drawn not to vote for this because I don't want to put the small business owners that are operating in, in brick and mortar out of business because we have food trucks in front. I do think they'll be excellent in the industrial areas and the lakefront areas um, for servicing those people. But I think if you write an ordinance, you need to make sure of all the precautions. And one of the precautions would be not running our small businesses out of business. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Kath. Thank you, Mayor Van Akron. Um, <coughs> we had looked at a few ordinances. And uh, some of those fees were 800 even $1,000 on the fees. And we looked at um, establishments that are taxpayers and then food trucks that are driving around and, and parking, you know, anywhere. Um, also, the $100 that they're paying, they're not paying that to the city. Are they not paying that to the county and the state? I believe at this time there are no, is there a fee? I think that the $100 that you're referring to is a different license that is offered by the city, which is a transient merchant license. It's dealing with door-to-door -door sales and has included push cart things and things. That's what you're talking about. It's right. a $100 fee. And the fee that we're looking at is a permit fee, not so much the transient. So it's a whole different fee. So. All right. Thank you. Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. One of my biggest issues with this is the fact that it essentially came out of nowhere. We have one food truck essentially operating, correct? Sure. Two. So this $500 fee just came out of thin air. That's, that's an issue and hopefully we can address that. The second issue is the hours of operation. Let's be honest here, besides festivals, th that's when they're gonna make their money is around <coughs> bar close. Um, maybe not letting them stay open till 6 a.m. but at least past bar time, three o'clock, 3.30. I forgot who uh, suggested it, but maybe have a trial period. We haven't had them long enough in the, in the town to actually see what's going to happen, if anything. We already have scuffles outside of bars. We already have the congregation, but maybe in coordination with the loitering, uh, loitering ordinance that they're working on and then putting some food trucks out there, we got to see what happens. We, we can talk about what ifs all day, but this is all new to us. So to, just to slap on a $500 fee just because we can, and to limit the hours, I think, is uh, it doesn't make much sense to me. Alderman Bourne. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, I believe this, I checked with uh, the city clerk this afternoon, and I believe this gentleman is paying almost $450 for a, uh, for a fee that he pays for the county. I forgot what it was called, so what is it called? I'm sorry. 
That fee that the gentleman is paying to the county, it's almost $450. What was that called? Mm, it's called a mobile restaurant permit, I think. Right. That they through, have to get like, from the county health department. Through the health department. Right. And uh, just for another point of information for my fellow council members, the gentleman who owns uh, Sparky's Hot Dog Stands, which have been an excellent addition to the community, I believe that gentleman, and that is mobile, I mean, he has different locations, but I believe that gentleman is paying a fee to the city of $150. Now, I realize this is a little bit different business, but it's still uh, not a brick and mortar uh, business like Alderman Lassard was talking to. And by the way, I agree with that, of having some restrictions on how close that he could park as far as close to Rupps or Fountain Park Restaurant. But I think, uh, and I go back to what Alderman Hammond said, I think the other gentleman is paying $150 per hot dog stand. I think it's quite a jump to go from a proposed 100 up to 500 in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Any other discussion? Alderman Bourne. Thank you. Alderman Hammond, I don't know if you had a, 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 an amount in mind uh, as far as the fee is concerned, if you'd want to make a proposal or I can make a proposal and see if the council would go along with it. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I do have a number in my head, but one of the things that strikes me is, you know, again, back to Chief Domogowski's comments, I think there's a couple things that need to be worked out here yet, the fee being one and this hours of operation thing being another. Um, and instead of hashing it out here, I think maybe it might be best to go back to committee and let them hash out some of those issues at that point. Um, because I, I, again, I think $500, is it 100, is it 200? Considering the, the bulk of the permitting comes from the county because they need it for the health issue, what do we need it for? You know, we're not in, in, uh, looking at it from a health issue standpoint other than that they're parking on city roads. So I, I think it needs to go back, in my opinion, back to the committee and have them take a stronger look at it um, and really look at this hours of operations thing as well. Is that a motion? Uh, Alderman Hammond. Can be. Yes. Not before you make the motion. Yes, sir. Um, there are a couple other vendors that have asked for these licenses, and they're kind of waiting to see what we're going to do. So I'd hate to put them off too long um, to, to get them started. They're ready to roll based on whatever our decision is tonight. Um, so if you do have a suggestion on the, on, it sounds like the only two things that people are concerned about is the operation time and, and the fee. So if there's some way to work that out, you know, I'd that could be done today. Or if you want to send it back to me, that's up to you. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I, I will offer up some amendments to section J in reference to the fee. I would uh, offer the amendment to lower that to $200. And then I would offer the amendment to strike the hours of operation altogether. At this point, I think at, at a later date, if we feel that uh, that would be necessary, that certainly could be something we could look at. Um, I too have a problem with the hours of operation on a couple different levels. One, I don't think our city government should be getting into the habit of restricting business. If, if this gentleman can sell euros until five in the morning, I, I applaud his efforts. I think the market should set his hours. Um, I believe the police department can handle issues as they arise. If there are people that being unruly at his card, I think they need to address that, but if people can handle themselves in a professional adult manner and, and order euros at five in the morning, I think they should be allowed to do so. Um, the other issue I have is that we restrict the sale of food from food carts until 6 a.m. If a food cart would want to open up in the South Pier District or um, down along the boardwalk here to sell food to fishermen that leave on their boats at four or five in the morning, um, I think we've restricted that access. So I really feel that we are overreaching. I think the business should be allowed to um, sell their product at, as the market demands, and, and we should move on from there. So I would make the motion to lower to $200 and to remove the hours altogether. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, amend the resolution to Change the fee. Change the ordinance, I'm sorry. Change the fee to $200 and remove the hour restrictions. Alderman. David, you would want that whole paragraph taken out? I, I believe it was section H. H, okay. Let me look. Okay. Is there any discussion on the amendment? <coughs> Hearing none, we'll vote on the amendment first. Call the roll, please. Hold on just a second. <laughs> so 
Hold on. Okay, an I vote would be voting for the amendments. Susie, Bill? 11 ayes, three noes. The amendment passes. Now we'll look for a motion to approve the ordinance or the committee report as amended. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would then make a motion to approve the committee report as amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the committee report and pass the ordinance as amended. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. One yes, two no. Bill? Thank you. 12 ayes, two noes. Motion carries. 7 6 from salary and grievance recommending changing the annual rate of the mayor's salary effective the period of the first payday of 12, 12 to April 12, May 12 through April of, of 2013 to read $150,000. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> yeah. 50,000 pass the tax salary. Alderman Raisler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the RC be accepted and adopted and that the substitute ordinance be put upon its passage. It's been moved and seconded that the committee report be accepted, adopted, and the substitute ordinance be put upon its passage. Alderman Raisler. Second. Thank you. Uh, as far as discussion goes, there's actually uh, an error in this, and I need to amend it to June of 2012. Uh, we met on the 30th of April, and it was decided that we were not going to be able to get this uh, in place in time for May. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, if the committee remind me if I'm correct, uh, it was moved to June. It was amended. So, In the substitute document, it says June. It does say June. Okay. J just on here, it says the original. Okay, I was it looking does. at it in the other, and I thought it said May, too, but just so we can make sure that it is June. Let me check. At least on the computer copy, it said May yet. So, just so we're all clear that it's going to be June, I'm happy. The aim to make you happy. Thanks. If you're happy, I'm happy. So, you want the substitute to read from May of 2012 through the end of the term in 2013. No, I'd like it to read the first payday of June 2012 through April 2013. That can be a typo. I'll change it. Yeah, thank you. Any other discussion? Clerk will call the roll. Hold on. Uh, sorry. City Attorney. Uh, I'd just like to comment that uh, this is contrary to law and is not enforceable if somebody's to challenge it. Uh, the issue would be who's going to challenge uh, agreeing to a lesser salary, but uh, I want to put that on the record. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. One is yes, two is no. <clears throat> Kevin. Kevin, thank you. <coughs> 13 eyes and one abstention. Motion carries. 7-7 seven, seven will be referred to the Committee of the Whole. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor Van Akron. Uh, I would make a motion to refer this back to Public Protection and Safety. Second. It's been moved and seconded to refer this document back to Public Protection and Safety. Alderman Bourne. Under discussion, Mayor, I appreciate the work that uh, Public Protection and Safety Committee has done on this issue so far by hearing the some of the constituents at their meeting last week. However, uh, I would much, prefer, and I, I will refer it to the committee of the whole at a future date. However, I wish that the committee would uh, get the input from the DNR and also from the sheriff, I'm sorry, the police chief over in Kohler. Uh, Alderman Versi called me when he was home over the weekend, and I guess he was working with his constituents on this, on this petition. And he said that the Kohler police chief uh, would like to come and talk to the uh, to the committee about his experience with the deer population over in Kohler. So, for those reasons, uh, I would like the committee to do some further work on the issue, and then come back with a recommendation, either to the committee of the whole or the council. And if it at that time, 
uh, if there's a referral to the Committee of the Whole, I would glad, gladly schedule it, but not at this time. Thank you. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a little background on the referral to the Committee of the Whole. Um, we did have uh, quite a few citizens come in and talk on this issue. Um, it, it was decided at that point that we would seek input from the DNR, and rather than trying myself or other committee members trying to summarize what the DNR had explained at the committee, we felt that considering there was going to be another meeting anyways, it was best that everyone hear what the DNR had to say. That way if there was any questions for the DNR, they could be asked from the floor. Um, another issue that was, uh, I guess, at least in my mind, why I thought it was appropriate to go to the committee of the whole is that I believe only one member of the committee represents the area that was being discussed. So I thought it was appropriate that everyone here from the DNR and that the, the two or three uh, other aldermen that represent this area hear that firsthand information from the DNR and have a vote on that. So I, I thought it was appropriate to send it to the Committee of the Whole. The vote at the committee was four to nothing to send it to the Committee of the Whole. That way we could hear from the DNR, decide what options are available in reference to dealing with the deer situation, and then decide what, um, what avenue we wanted to take, if any. Uh, again, from my understanding, there's a permitting process. There, there would be costs involved. We, we are seeking the information from the DNR. I felt it was most appropriate to hear that everybody hear that at the Committee of the Whole. Again, that's why I supported the, the motion at the committee. It was a four to nothing vote there. Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. Just to add to uh, David, is um, we were told that uh, by the police department that it's not a public safety issue, it's more of a nuisance, and it is a citywide problem. So once again, that's why we wanted to bring it back to the whole body. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Carlson. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate those comments, but for a little history for some of the newer aldermen, this issue was brought to the council, I believe, two years ago, maybe three years ago. Alderman uh, Hanna was uh, the chairman of public protection and safety at that time, and that committee did extensive research at that time on the issue at the committee level, and I don't believe it ever came to the committee of the whole. That committee looked at all of the data from whoever they got it from, and made a recommendation, and I guess the recommendation at that time was to do nothing, but that would be up to this committee. But I, you know, with our standing committee system, I would much rather see the informational work be done at the committee level, and those aldermen who wish to attend the committee meeting can certainly, can certainly attend, and I'll try to attend if I'm available. But again, I would much rather have that done on the committee level, and uh, right now I don't think this is a committee of the whole issue. Thank you. I think the Committee of the Whole is a committee level. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, something that I had forgotten, and I appreciate Alderman um, Boren bringing this up. Uh, the notes that we had gotten from uh, uh, Assistant City Attorney Adams indicated that in 2008-2009, in the uh, uh, December and January, the matter was actually referred to the Committee of the Whole, which then decided not to hire an outside sharpshooter at taxpayer expense and decided not to deal with the issue at that problem. Again, using that reference back in 2008, 2009, considering that it was handled in the Committee of the Whole, was another reason that we uh, looked at sending it to the Committee of the Whole. Uh, as Alderman Carlson indicated, the police department was there, they gave their input. They don't feel that this is a uh, public safety issue. There has only been one car deer accident in the area that's being discussed, and that was out in the uh, LS and Blackstock uh, area, which actually borders the county all the way throughout that area. Um, they, they are not having inc incidents of car accidents. They're not having problems with deer running into houses. Um, at, at this point, it, it was the opinion of the police department that this is not a public safety issue. Uh, again, going back to the other reasons, as well as the fact that the last time this was here, it was handled in the Committee of the Whole. Again, the committee felt it was uh, important to send it there. Thank you. Alderman Hammond. Um, I guess I'm just a little confused why we're spending 10 <laughs> minutes deciding on which committee we're going to send this to when, you know, I don't necessarily know if we're going to have a committee the whole meeting anytime soon, but if it sits and waits until the next one, you know, again, it, is it really this big of a deal to spend this much time and energy determining which committee something is going to go to. Um, you know, if it goes to Committee of the Whole and Alderman Bourne, uh, the chairman doesn't have a meeting for a month or two, it'll wait for a month or two. I mean, again, um, I don't know why we're wasting this much time and energy on this. Thank you. Alderman Wangabin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
I, I agree with Alderman Bourne. Um, <coughs> I think this is a problem that should be referred back, I happen to be on that committee, back to our committee for a little further discussion. I was involved in them a couple of years ago when we discussed this whole matter. And what's always struck me, and still does, is it seems to be a lopsided issue. There's just as many deer on the south side of town, and we get no complaints from the south side of town. They always all come from the northeast side of town. And I don't know if the deer on the northeast side of town are more ornery than the ones on the south side of town, <laughs> or, or you know what it is, but uh, is it really that great a problem? I mean, is it causing uh, danger to life and limb? It was stated that these deer carry Lyme disease, well, the Lyme disease doesn't grow on the deer. The Lyme disease comes from ticks and things that are on the bushes. I mean, your dog can carry Lyme disease. So is it really that great a problem? I think we should get it back to the committee where it started and the decision should be made there. I think this calls for some leadership and look at the problem and instead of referring it or kicking, kicking the can down the road, let's, keep, let's try and settle it where, you know, where, where it is now and that is, uh, in uh, public protection and safety. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. I couldn't have said it any better than Alderman Wangaman. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> any other discussion? The motion to send it to public protection and safety, the attorney said, is the motion that's on the floor current. May I have a hall? Sorry? Did you, did you I, made a I, I made a motion to refer it to, to back to public protection, public and, protection safety and safety, and somebody Second. seconded it. Okay, I yep. seconded that's where we're at. Alderman Van Akron. Just, just to again go over some of the background. This is not by any means an effort to kick anything down the can or a lack of leadership. I thought it was important that people hear from the DNR rather than myself or anyone else try to summarize what the DNR had to say, and then anyone else can also ask questions and, and get feedback in an open dialogue with the representative from the DNR. I thought it was important to hear their options, to hear the process, to hear the permits, to hear the fees, all of that for everyone. Th that was really the, the emphasis behind this. I, I think it's appropriate to send it there. I, I guess we'll leave it at that. All right, any other discussion? The motion on the floor is to refer it back to the committee of no, public, public protection. protection and safety. Right. Committee. And an I vote. All the men hang on, all the men. Bellinger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I represent that area, and uh, if it gets referred back to your committee, Dave, I will be there and uh, see what the DNR has to say, or if we get the police chief from Calder, whoever would come, you know, I will make myself available. Thank you. Any other discussion? Again, the motion is to send it back to public protection and safety. Clerk will call the roll. Okay, number one would be yes to send it back, two would be no, three would be abstain. Don? Sorry. Thank you. Nine eyes to send it back, five noes. Motion carried back to public protection and safety. Eight one through eight seven to be referred. <laughs> Other matters, city attorney? Nine one is an RO by the city clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2012 and June 30, 2013. There's nine two also. There's nine two also. And what are we doing with this one? Uh, that one's law and licensing. This is going to law and licensing. Yep. And nine dash two is an appointment by the mayor. Honorable members of the council, I hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration. Gene Kittleson to be considered for appointment to the Board of Police and Fire Commissioners to fill the unexpired term of William Gottsecker, whose term expires 4-25-2016, signed by the mayor. That will be lied over. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor Van Akron. Uh, Attorney McLean, could you read over the makeup of what the Fire and Police Commission is supposed to be as far as the, the breakdown of the members? Do you have that with you? Yeah. The, uh, as far as the what, what parties, Republican, Democrat, or Independent, what the makeup is supposed to be? The statute says that there'll be no more than three members of the, of the five-member committee from the same party, so that's what it says. Uh, I think our ordinance says the same thing, but I'll yeah. check. Yeah, I, 
2-488, no appointment shall be made to the Board of Police and Fire Commissioners, which will result in more than three members of the board belonging to the same political party. Uh, if I could just follow up, Mayor. Uh, is there, is there a litmus test or how do, we, how do we determine whether a person is a Republican or a Democrat or an independent? Do they have to be a registered Republican with the local party or the same with the Democrats to be considered party affiliated or what's the, how is that determined? Well, it's a good question. I don't think that there is any uh, statutory criteria, it, um, at least in the past. We've not based it on card-carrying membership because, frankly, I don't think uh, there are that many card-carrying Republicans or Democrats or any other party uh, anymore. I think it's been based on uh, sort of self-reporting and sort of recognized affiliation. Alderman Bourne, I think a couple of the members have expressed that they are Republicans or Democrats, and, and on the current board there are two people who have declared themselves as Democrats. There's one person who's declared themselves as a Republican and one who has declared themselves as an independent. Uh, I think uh, Jean Kittleson's going to declare herself as an independent, but even if she did declare herself as one or the other, there still would be no more than three. Well, I don't. If and I that can, will I over. Uh, well, go ahead. That will I over. That's fine. Thank you. And we now need a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Move to adjourn. Second. Then move and second it to adjourn. All those in favor signify by pushing, pushing one. Pushing one. Push one. There you go. Up your push clickers. One. Clickers, push one. John, Bill, push number one. Don. Yep. That's right. All right.